All right. It's it's uh, good to see everyone this morning. And um, in the wake of uh, this uh, unbelievable uh, daring attack uh, of by Iran of Israel, over 300 drones, rockets, missiles were sent and 99% of them were shot down, as we know. Um, it's uh, not just by Israel, the majority of them by Israel, but they were also shot down by US, French, and Jordanian uh, means. So when I had heard that uh, Jordan, uh, like Saturday night, uh, when it first reported about Jordan, I thought that that was really something and that Jordan has been a vocal critic, very, very much so, about Israel's conduct of the war in Gaza. Uh, it's a major supplier of humanitarian aid to Gaza. And it's just been, uh, you know, even though a peace treaty has been uh, signed between Israel and Jordan since uh, in 1994, it's um, at times becomes what's known as a cold peace and um, uh, like it is now. So the fact that Jordan, that Jordan participated in this alliance to uh, uh, shoot down these drones, rockets, and missiles. In fact, there's a picture of in, in a neighborhood outside of Ahmad of such a, a missile that was shot down that uh, people are gathered around it in the street. The fact that Jordan participated in it is a good, is a good sign that how, how deep uh, the, the peace is and that even though people talk, leaders talk, it doesn't mean that uh, it represents actually what the relationship is like. So um, I, I want to share um, two articles about uh, an analysis of what happened Saturday night and moving forward. And um, we're, it's veering into the military political strategy, which I'm not an expert in, but I think uh, the way Tom Friedman We'll look at his op-ed that's in the New York Times today, and um, David Horowitz, who's the um, founding editor of Times of Israel, what his piece was in Times of Israel yesterday. So I uh, just want to, two uh, kind of uh, different perspectives, well-regarded uh, journalists, well-regarded um, thinkers and writers about Israel, I don't necessarily always agree with Tom Friedman and his perspective and the conclusions that he reaches, uh, but his analysis uh, is pretty spot on. So uh, let me share my screen. And um, this is the uh, uh, Thomas Friedman article that appeared this morning. So I'll make it bigger. Okay. Um, it would be easy to be dazzled by the way Israeli, American, and other allied militaries shot down virtually every Iranian drone, cruise missile, and ballistic missile launched at Israel on Saturday and conclude that Iran had made its point, retaliating for Israel's allegedly killing a top Iranian commander operating against Israel from Syria, and now we can call it a day. Okay, so tit for tat. Uh, Israel, you know, uh, just a, a week or so ago, <clears throat> allegedly, um, Israel didn't deny it and it didn't say that it did it, but everybody knows that Israel did it, attacking uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus and killing seven military, Iranian military people there, including the number one person who's directing all uh, Hezbollah, uh, Iran, uh, the, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard and its support for uh, Hezbollah, right? So uh, these were uh, important targets. 
and Israel tries to, when it knows it can get a target without other uh, uh, corollary damage, uh, then it'll try to do it. So apparently these, these 300 missiles were a retaliation for that, and one might think that that's it. That would be a dangerous misreading of what just happened and a huge geopolitical mistake by the West and the world at large. There now needs to be a massive, sustained global initiative to isolate Iran, not only to deter it from trying such an adventure again, but also to give reason to Israel not to automatically retaliate militarily. That would be a grievous error too. Iran has a regional network and Iran, Israel needs a regional alliance along with the U.S. to deter it over the long run. So, so Tom Friedman's going to go on in the rest of the article to kind of make his point that Israel should not retaliate. Um, and so I just want to say, you know, Israel is between a rock and a hard place. Israel, like any... Um, like any um, country, is um, morally and ethically permitted to and required to protect its citizens and has a justification, if attacked, to uh, retaliate. Nobody can argue that. And it's just standard operating procedure of any country. And the United Nations is, support, is supposed to support every country in its um, effort to uh, protect its citizens. Okay, so um, it's a Jewish concept. It's a global legal concept. That, so Israel would be right to retaliate. However, um, the, re the attack and retaliation uh, don't always happen in a vacuum. And uh, because uh, Israel's, it, the Iranian attack uh, was not in a vacuum. Um, and uh, if Israel retaliates, that would not be in a vacuum either, because you never know what Iran would do in response to that and how things could escalate quite quickly. And there's the variable of nuclear weapons. So uh, you don't know what Iran has available right now or how long it would take to make a nuclear weapon. The fact that none of the 300 missiles had a nuclear warhead is, uh, is lucky or perhaps reflects that Iran doesn't have it yet. We don't know. We don't know. That's, that's a variable <clears throat> that is not, should not be worth uh, risking. So when, from a Jewish perspective, we think about when we are when one is attacked, one has the right to retaliate. In fact, before one attacks, one has the, has the right to preempt an attack. So, haba lahar gacha, hashkem lahar go. Someone who it's clear is coming to kill you, you get up before them to kill them. That's a rabbinic uh, precept and and clear that that's how Israel can conduct its affairs of and has conducted its affairs as a Jewish democracy. Okay, so the the so what what Friedman will will do now is is go on to uh, say why Israel should not retaliate. Um, uh, so. You know, number one, the, the, there has to be a global initiative to isolate Iran. So there must be a major diplomatic and economic, uh, there must be major diplomatic and economic consequences for Iran with countries like China finally stepping up. 
when Tehran fired all those drones and missiles, it could not know that virtually all of them would be intercepted. Some were shot down over Jerusalem. A missile could have hit Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of Islam's holiest shrines. And you could see pictures online of Iranian rockets being intercepted in the skies right over the mosque. That, you saw that on the news, if you're watching the news Saturday night, you saw that on social media, on other websites. Uh, another could have hit the Israeli parliament or a high-rise apartment house causing massive casualties. In other words, we're talking about an escalation without precedent in a long-running, tightly contained shadow war between Iran and Israel that had almost exclusively been limited to targeted Israeli strikes against Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps units in Lebanon and Syria, where they have no business being in the first place, and Iran retaliating by have its, having its Lebanese proxy militia Hezbollah fire rockets at Israel, right? So the Israel-Iran war was happening through these proxies uh, when Israel attacks and doesn't uh, take credit for it, um, at targets, military bases, the Iranian embassy, other targets like that in Syria and Lebanon. And uh, then uh, Hezbollah, that is Iran, retaliates by firing rockets at Israel. You know, we have to remember that there's a large segment of Israel's population in the north that has been, that has been displaced from their homes. 70,000 people, something like that, all along Israel's northern border from Kiryat Shmona north um, uh, have been displaced because of rockets that have been fired by Hezbollah. Okay, so that's something that doesn't get reported too often. It's in times of Israel, but it's not in other Western media, American media. Um, We've also seen Iran smuggling arms and explosives from Syria into Jordan, Gaza, and the West Bank to be used to kill Israelis and destabilize Jordan. And the Mossad is assassinating a nuclear scientist inside Iran. But Israel has never launched such a massive missile strike directly at Iran, and Iran had never done so to Israel either before this. Indeed, no country had attacked Israel directly since Saddam Hussein's Iraq did with Scud missiles 33 years ago. You remember uh, how gas masks were handed out to everybody in Israel's population, and they didn't have, back then, 33 years ago, 1991, uh, Israel didn't have, and, and, and nobody had the technology at that point to be able to shoot down rockets just like that. There was some, but it didn't really work. So you're at the whim of uh, Iraq's technology of being able to aim it, uh, aim these Scud missiles uh, appropriately. So there was damage done throughout Israel, but I don't think anybody was killed. Without a US-led global initiative to impose sanctions on Iran and further isolate it on the world stage, Iran's behavior would be tacitly normalized, in which case Israel will most likely retaliate in kind, and we're on our way to a major Middle East war in $250 a barrel oil, right? So there has to be some kind of sanction, some kind of punishment, global punishment for Iran. And if there isn't global punishment for Iran, then Israel can say, well, if nobody's punishing Iran, we have to. And... Um, uh, and so Israel will be within its right to do that. And if it does that, then things escalate and uh, woe to the economy, right? That's where everybody, everybody would react first uh, because of the economy and how, remember in 1973, after the Yom Kippur War, how there was an oil embargo, right? And, and people were waiting in line to, uh, at the gas stations. The alternative to a wider full-scale regional war, which we don't want and Israel doesn't want, cannot be a return to the status quo ante, that is, what it was before, uh, says Nader Musavizadeh, the founder and CEO of the geopolitical cons consulting firm Macro Advisory Partners and a senior advisor to Kofi Annan when he was the UN Secretary General. So I believe he's an Iranian. Okay, that, that name sounds like a Persian name. A global effort to isolate Iran, Musa Vizadeh said, added, is the best way to, to separate the regime, regime from its people, reassure Israel and Israelis of their security, 
and remove the need for further regional military escalation, which would be a gift to Iran and its proxies, right? Iran wants nothing more than things to escalate. And so if uh, the United States can arrange a global effort to isolate Iran, then perhaps Israel will go along with that, like it did in 1991 when Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir did not did not retaliate under uh, under uh, uh, ad, 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 ad phone calls from from the first Bush to him. It's also the best way to ensure that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel does not drag the United States into a regional war to shore up his own crumbling political base. It's impossible to exaggerate the political military implications of what just happened. Shortly after the missile strike, President Ibrahim Raisi of Iran issued a statement declaring that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps had taught a lesson to the Zionist enemy. It sure did, but not, it may not be the one Raisi thinks. Iran just unwittingly revealed to the whole world that Iran's government is so penetrated by Western espionage agencies because so many Iranians hate their own government that President Biden was able to predict almost the exact hour of attack over a day in advance, and it showed the whole world that Israel and its Western allies have far superior anti-missile capabilities than Iran has missile capabilities. Okay, so the lessons right away are how uh, Western powers have infiltrated uh, into Iran to gain intelligence, right? So to know that these attacks are about to happen, and also that the anti-missile capabilities of Israel and the United States is far superior to the, than the what Iran has. Okay, so it's, it's, it's an, an important lesson that hopefully Iran learned. As the Haaretz veteran military correspondent ha Amos Harel wrote Sunday, we're talking about an unprecedented achievement in the history of Israel's wars, albeit with some help from friends, that largely takes away the main card held by Iran and the Axis, drones and missiles, right? Unprecedented achievement that Iran thinks its drones and missiles are powerful and would scare anybody but 300 were sent and 99% of them were shot down. The impressive arrow system interceptions have garnered most of the attention, but Israeli and American pilots downed hundreds of cruise missiles and drones. All right, so all these things were flying at different speeds into Israel. Some of them went into outer space in order to, as its, as its trajectory. So, you know, so there are a variety of sophisticated anti-missile uh, systems were used to shoot them down at various courses in the sky from Iran to Israel. So many were shot over Jordan before they even got close to Israel. One has to assume that Iran and its proxies have to be both disappointed and unnerved by this turn of events. As Har Harel added, the Iranian intention as evaluated ahead of, the, ahead of the attack was to put on a display of its capabilities with an attack on military targets. An analysis of the areas in which warnings were sounded suggests the target could have been the Nevatim Air Base in southern Israel. It appears that the Iranians planned to destroy the base and the advanced F-35 fighters jets stationed there which are the crown jewel of American aid to Israel. Iran failed completely. Well, one missile got through and did slight damage to the air base. Instead, the Iranian attack may have been limited to badly wounding a seven-year-old Israeli Muslim Bedouin girl hit by falling shrapnel. This, had, this is outside the city of Arad. So you can picture the geography of Israel. Arad is south of Hebron. In, uh, in, the, at, in the northern Negev, and there's a road from Arad that leads down to the Dead Sea and to Masada. So Arad there is, is like in the confluence of Negev, 
Judean desert, uh, and, and Judean hills. Uh, and if that's how effective, so she was seriously injured, she's still in the hospital in critical condition. If that's how effective Iran's offense was, its leaders have to now be wondering how good its defenses are. If Israel now chooses to retaliate, Hezbollah has to be asking the same, right? So if the offense isn't good, maybe the defense is bad too, so that Israel, if it, if it retaliated, could get in um, untouched. That may explain why Raisi, after his boast about teaching Israel a lesson, asked or pleaded that the U.S. and all other supporters of the occupying regime appreciate this responsible and proportionate action by the Islamic Republic of, of Iran and not go on the offensive against Iran. In other words, we failed, but maybe we showed you that you shouldn't uh, retaliate. Message to the world from Tehran. We were just sending a little warning shot. Nothing to worry about here. Let's move on. That's not only because Raisi is worried about his external front. Early this month, Haaretz reported that Iranian soccer fans, and this is interesting, about what's going on in Iran and what kind of protests are happening in Iran. Uh, Haaretz reported that Iranian soccer fans in Tehran's Ariyamer Stadium were asked to observe a minute of silence in honor of the seven members of Iran's elite revolutionary guards, including the top general, Mohammad Reza Zahidi, who were killed in the Israeli airstrike on its consulate in Damascus. Okay, so imagine you're at a soccer game. Uh, the PA announcement says we're going to have a moment of silence now to remember the seven uh, uh, heroic Iranians who were killed in the embassy. Instead, so instead of a moment of silence, spectators began booing and blowing air horns in an apparent act of protest. In a video circulating on social media, fans can be seen loudly interrupting the moment of silence. In one video that made the rounds on X, formerly Twitter, fans can be seen shouting, take that Palestinian flag and shove it. Okay, you can read the rest yourself, right? Imagine that, Iranian citizens saying, take that Palestinian flag and shove it. And this is not the first time it happened at football matches. Many Iranians understand that the regime's obsession with destroying the Jewish state is nothing but a costly way to divert the Iranian public's attention from its murderous crackdown at home against its own people. And this soccer match story indicates, as the soccer match story indicates, people are growing less afraid to say so in public, especially after the regime has killed an estimated 750 women, girls, and men since a nationwide protest uprising started on September 6, 2022, after the death of a young Kurdish woman in the custody of Iran's morality police. Okay, that long sentence says, September 16, 2022, Iran kills uh, uh, a young Kurdish woman uh, who was arrested. 750 women and girls and men have been uh, killed in protests since then. So there are, uh, there's a movement of protests that is happening in Iran. Uh, one reason Iran supports the Hamas war and prefers that Israel remain stuck in Gaza and occupying the West Bank is that it keeps the world and many Americans focused on Israeli actions rather than on the brutal crackdown against democracy protesters in Iran and on Iran's imperialist influence in the region where it uses proxies to control the politics of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen and uses those countries as military bases to attack Israel. Better to focus attention on Israel than to have the attention focused on the mess uh, domestically in Iran. No one should think that Iran is just a paper tiger. Tehran can still unleash thousands of shorter range rockets against Israel through Hezbollah, and because some of these rockets have precision guidance, they could do significant damage to Israel's infrastructure. Iran has bigger missiles in its arsenal as well. Still, what happened Saturday is ultimately a significant boost for what Tom Friedman calls the inclusion network of the Middle East. That is, more open, connected countries like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the United Arab, United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Israel, and NATO allies. 
So that's the inclusion network. And a real setback for the resistance network. So those are closed autocratic systems represented by Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, and Iran's Shiite militias in Iraq and Russia. Okay, so it's this inclusion network, Israel and friends against Iran and friends. The sound within Iran and the resistance network on Sunday morning is that sound you hear from your car's GPS after a wrong turn, recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. So that's, um, again, so that, that's what he, uh, the, the initial analysis of what happened and, um, and how Israel, how it's Im imperative that this alliance that helped Israel shoot down these missiles May, uh, remain a strong alliance and helps uh, isolate Iran. If that can happen, then most strategists probably would agree with Tom Friedman that Israel should not retaliate uh, and should try to stop Israel from retaliating. There's there's one more uh, article. I want to share the, um, the David Horowitz uh, op-ed that was uh, from yesterday. So uh, let me share my screen again. Uh, just a second here. There it is. There it is. All right. So this is, there are a lot more ads on Times of Israel that are going to be distracting here. Um, so th this is the title of the article. Israel warded off a huge Iranian attack, but that success is not the same as victory. So seven lessons, he has seven le or eight insights into the events that happened, okay? Insight number one, the opposite of October 7th. So this is lesson number one. Israel's handling of the unprecedented Iranian drone and missile attack overnight Saturday was the complete opposite of the unfathomable catastrophe of October 7th. In utter contrast to the failures at every level that enabled Hamas to invade six months ago, Israel, with considerable input from the U.S. and regional allies, was braced for the Iranian attack. Its intelligence on what was about to unfold was accurate. It prepared effectively to meet the onslaught. Its military establishment, and especially the Air Force and pilots, rose to meet the danger and Again, with the assistance of the U.S. and regional allies, Israel's leadership thwarted the attack, fulfilling its obligation to keep its citizenry, citizenry safe from enemy aggression. Okay, so that's the opposite of what happened on October 7th. Israel had no idea what was about to happen or ignored information that could have led to understanding what was about to happen. Uh, miscommunication in, in, at, at the highest level this was the opposite. We knew what was going to happen. Israel knew what was going to happen. Had a, a system in place to uh, to do something about it, and and succeeded uh, in the best possible way. Another lesson by the numbers. According to the IDF, Iran launched 170 drones at Israel, not one of which reached Israeli airspace. So they were shot down even before they got to Israel. All were intercepted in the course of their hours long journeys by Israel Air Force, the US, UK, France, and Jordan. So if they weren't in Israeli airspace, that means Israeli Air Force was flying outside of Israel's airspace. Where, was, where were, were those pilots flying? That he doesn't say. Were they allowed to fly in Jordan? Were they flying in Syria? We don't know. But the US, UK, France, and Jordan shot down um, those drones. Iran also fired 300 cruise missiles, some of which are reportedly capable of carrying one ton warheads. Again, according to the IDF, not one of them reached Israeli airspace, right? So these cruise missiles also shot down before they even got to Israeli airspace. That also required a coordinated effort, 
Somebody else had to have helped to do that. All were intercepted earlier in their approximately two-hour journeys, 25 of them by the IAF. So I think drones, it was going to take seven to nine hours, cruise missiles, two hours, and then uh, so 25 of the 30 were shot down by the uh, Israel Air Force, right? And here's the picture. This is the Dome of the Rock, not Al-Aqsa, Al right? People confuse. They think this is a mosque. It's not. It's a shrine. Al-Aqsa is another building to the right of this. Uh, so here are incoming, and here are uh, here is one um, uh, Patriot missile or arrow or whatever shooting down one of these incomings. Finally, and most dramatically, Iran launched 120 ballistic missiles at Israel and did so even as it was telling the United Nations that its military action against Israel was concluded. Along their ultra rapid routes, I, I think it took 12 minutes for the ballistic missiles. I, I saw the, that comparison of drones versus crews versus ballistic missiles. I think the ballistic missiles would have taken 12 minutes from Iran to reach Israel. Along their ultra-rapid routes, almost all of them were downed by Israel's long-range Arrow air defense system and several reportedly by the U.S. Less than a handful evaded Israel's defenses, right, handful being five, three. So, right, if at 300 all told, 1% got through, so that's three. Um, uh, less than a handful evaded Israel's defenses and hit the Nevatim air base in southern Israel, where F-35s are based, causing what the IDF said was minor damage to infrastructure. The runway was not impacted and the combat planes operations were not affected. Right. So a little damage here on the base, who knows, a shed, knocked out, whatever it was, not the runway, that would have been uh, a, a success or any of the planes. Okay, so now another lesson, the U.S. alliance. Relations between the Netanyahu government and the Biden administration have grown increasingly strained over the six months plus of Israel's war to dismantle Hamas and Gaza, with the U.S. openly fuming at the civilian death toll and inadequate humanitarian aid, White House officials rejecting IDF plans for major ground offensive in the final Hamas stronghold of Rafah, and the president personally and politically mistrustful of the prime minister. Right? Relations between Biden and the administration and Netanyahu are not good right now. In the days ahead of Iran, Iran's anticipated response to the Israel Air Force alleged April 1 killing of leading figures in Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard, Guard Corps inside Iran's embassy compound, compound in Damascus, however, the U.S. sprang to Israel's defense. Okay, so it's one thing for Biden to not like Netanyahu. It's another to know that at its core, is U.S. and Israel are strong. It sought to deter Iran diplomatically, coordinated intimately with Israel in preparing for the defensive action, dispatched, dispatched its CENTCOM chief, shared intel, activated regional allies, and mobilized its own forces, right? In other words, U.S. went to work to defend Israel. When the attack began, U.S. intel was critical in enabling the immensely effective response by Israel, the U.S. itself, and regional partners, including but not limited to Jordan. The partnership was concrete and years of military preparation, coordination, and innumerable regional drill, drills bore fruit, right? So again, just to reiterate, it's one thing for leaders to be talking and sounding terrible, like President Obama and Netanyahu did not like each other either, but at its core, there was still uh, uh, coordinated drills, uh, that, that military drills that always are conducted intelligence is shared and uh, the uh, that the the foundation of the military alliance to defend Israel is strong so that that is an important lesson learned from Saturday night but it has its limits in their 25-minute phone call 
held after it was clear that Iran's onslaught had been blocked. However, U.S. President Joe Biden reportedly told Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, you got to win, take the win, and not to respond militarily. Right? You can almost picture President Biden saying that. Were Israel to ignore this advice, he reportedly made plain, the U.S. would not, in contrast to Saturday night, participate alongside Israel. So it's one thing to work hand in hand to defend Israel. It's quite another thing to work hand in hand with Israel to retaliate. The U.S. has also reportedly made clear in the wake of the April 1 raid in Damascus that it once advanced warning from Israel of any future such airstrikes early enough in the process to be able to have its say. It seems fairly clear the U.S. regards the alleged Israeli Air Force strike that killed the Iranian general as misconceived and would have opposed it if it had been informed in sufficient time rather than shortly before the blast. Some Israeli officials maintain, however, that Zahedi, the general, was a highly prized and necessary target as the most senior Iranian military officer in Syria and Lebanon responsible for orchestrating terrorism against Israel from across those borders and in and from the West Bank, right? So it was an important target from Israel's perspective. Israel's going to take out the target with minimal of a side effect, and uh, Israel was going to take the risk. Uh, assuming it was carried out by the Air Force, the strike would have necess necessitated approval from the political leadership and the political leadership in turn would have sought an assessment from the security establishment regarding Iran's likely response, right? In other words, Netanyahu directed it with advice from, uh, from the security establishment of Israel. Unconfirmed reports in recent days have suggested that Israel believed the response would be relatively limited. Well, so they are wrong. <laughs> 300 missiles. Israel, it should be noted, has reportedly targeted very senior Iranian officials in the past, including the father of the Iranian nuclear program on Iranian soil without prompting anything like the Saturday night response, right? So in other words, they thought, hey, we killed this civilian who was part of the Iranian nuclear program in Iran itself, and Iran didn't retaliate. So why would we think that they would retaliate now when we're targeted military targets, that is military people, as opposed to a civilian? The difference this time is at least partly a likely consequence of Israel's weakened deterrent capacity over the past year plus, and especially given the failures of October 7th. So Iran might have thought, huh, Israel's weak now because of its ongoing war with Hamas, now would be a time to take advantage when before it might not have been uh, a good time. Israel has for decades prided itself on its capacity to defend itself by itself against all enemies, albeit with an immense reliance on U.S. armed supplies and U.S.-led diplomatic support, right? Even getting uh, Ethiopian Jews out of Ethiopia could not have been done without the help of um, of um, President Bush, the first Bush at the time, and, and, and uh, U.S. Uh, help with that. But uh, Israel in 1976, on its own, went and got the hostages out of the airport in Entebbe from the hijacked plane, right? So that's what Israel is willing to do and capable to do. Um, so, uh, Saturday night marked the first significant instance of Israel defending itself with the direct, active, and crucial participation of the U.S. and other allies. And that is now apparently being followed by a U.S. military bear hug, a constraining embrace by a superpower ally that currently believes it understands Israel's interests better than Israel does, and that also has its own and its other allies' interests to look after. Right. So again, Israel between a rock and a hard place. You got the love of U.S. with the uh, subsequent love of other countries, Saudi Arabia included, in this alliance. And Israel has to then take that love and weigh that love against its interests. So a success with profound limitations. Biden hailed Israel's remarkable capacity to defend itself 
and declared that Israel had sent a clear message to its foes that they cannot effectively threaten the security of Israel. But it's absolutely certain that Israel's foes are not reading any such a sensibly clear message. Hezbollah remains firmly ensconced across the northern border. We wait to definitively learn the considerations that saw Hezbollah continue to refrain on Saturday from the kind of colossal onslaught in Israel, including with precision guiding, guided missiles for which Israel has no adequate defense. But it is waging near relentless conflict and tens of thousands of Israelis have no foreseeable prospect of being able to safely return to their homes in northern Israel, right? So Saturday night was a success, but it's limited because Hezbollah still fires rockets at northern Israel and 70,000 Israelis are displaced from their homes. The Houthis in Yemen are apparently beyond anybody's control and Iranian proxy run wild. Hamas, so that's, in other words, it's a, it's a short-term, one-shot success, but the bigger picture of what's still going on shows that there's a lot more work to be done. Hamas has hunkered down in Gaza, a quarter of its military strength and much of its leadership intact, right? A quarter of its military strength is still there. That's why the question about attacking Rafa is a legitimate question. If the leadership is there, quarter of its military strength still intact, uninterested in a hostage deal, right? The current deal is cease fire and not returning any hostages until the second phase of the, this supposed deal that Hamas is offering. Confident that it will survive the war and rebuild and rearm its war machine. While the US president may have told Netanyahu, you gotta win, the resounding success of Saturday's defense is not the same as a victory. And the Iranian leadership plainly does not regard Saturday night's assault as a defeat. Tehran, without doubt, anticipated wreaking considerable harm with its long-prepared, diverse, and potentially immense potent mix of drones and missiles. There will likely be a great deal of dismay and recrimination at the lack of military success. But after years in which Israel threatened relentlessly to target Iran's nuclear facilities, and indeed engaged in a series of operations to set back the Ayatollah's nuclear program, it was Iran that launched the first major attack between the two enemies. It bragged that it was able to scare the Israeli public for days ahead of the much-touted assault, and it now claims to have changed the equation, warning that future Israeli strikes on Iranian territory, including its international diplomatic premises, will henceforth again be met by Iranian retaliatory strikes on Israel. So. What kind of victory was it? Is, uh, Iran took the first step and now is holding the cards. Rather than being chastened by the failure to cause graver harm in Israel, humiliated by the defensive capacity shown by Israel and its allies, or deterred by the evidence of the partnership between the U.S., Israel, and others in the region, it's warning Israel against retaliation for Saturday's attack and warning the U.S., too, that its bases will be targeted if it joins in. Right. So there there's it's not you can be happy now that we thwarted that attack, but there's more to worry about now than there was before Saturday night. The Israeli response ostensibly informed sources in the prime minister's orbit were asserting, even as the Iranian attack was still in progress, that Israel's response would be rapid and substantial. According to one report, Biden, in their call, persuaded Netanyahu not to approve an immediate retaliation. So perhaps Netanyahu was planning a retaliation Saturday night, and Biden convinced him not to do it. The War Cabinet was meeting on Sunday afternoon to discuss the issue further. That's yesterday afternoon. Israeli officials are privately indicating that a response needs to be predicated on what Iran attempted to do. That is, it attempted to terrify a nation, inflict casualties and devastation, destroy a crucial air base and more. So base the response on what it tried to do rather than the little that it actually managed. They also note that the ostensible new Iranian equation with the threat of an Iranian response to future Israeli strikes and operations cannot be allowed to take hold. The temptation to hit back fast will be acute and Netanyahu will be under political pressure to act. This would, of course, be in defiance of the U.S. and would threaten the coalition that pulled together so effectively on Saturday. A response there needs to be. 
one that is strategically planned, right? That doesn't threaten this alliance with the United States and show that Israel is alone because Israel can't be alone. The critical threat. In this context, it's worth remembering the events of early 1991 when Saddam Hussein's Iraq fired 42 Scud missiles into an Israel that had no defense against them. The hope and belief that the Patriot missile defense system would intercept the Scuds proved misplaced. Then Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir was persuaded not to hit back at Iraq, largely by the Bush administration, which warned him that an Israeli response risked destroying the coalition of allies gearing up to take on Saddam. That episode underlines that there is more than one way to face down a regional aggressor and that an immediate retaliatory lashing out is not always the most effective. Saddam was erroneously believed to be developing a nuclear capability, while the Iranians are categorically a long way down the path to nuclear weapons and have the capacity to break out the bomb at fairly short notice. Saturday night's thwarted Iranian effort to cause harm Devastating harm in Israel underlines, as never before, the supreme imperative for Israel, the United States, and life-affirming nations in the region and worldwide to prevent the Islamic Republic from completing its nuclear weapons drive. That's what, the, that's what he says this alliance should be focused on, make sure that Iran can't have nuclear weapons. Imagine if Iran had nuclear weapon, nuclear warheads at its disposal on Saturday night. And Iran with this leadership and a nuclear capability is simply unthinkable. Whatever the complex pros and cons of a direct response to Saturday night's attack, that wider imperative and the diplomatic and military alliances necessary to stop Iran has to be the prime consideration. Following the events of Saturday night, after all, Iran can be expected to pursue its nuclear program with still greater determination. Thwarting it will necessitate the deepest possible Israeli alliance with the United States and other potential allies. So he's suggesting work, Israel, work hard to convince these allies that came to its defense that an added defense needs to be uh, thwarting Iran's uh, cap uh, ability to acquire, uh, develop and acquire nuclear weapons. And finally, it's quite staggering. It, it is quite staggering the rapidity with which Israel has moved in the past few hours from believing itself to be on the verge of regional war to a return to something akin to routine. Leaving aside for a moment the fact that life in Israel has been anything but routine since October 7th, that there's an ongoing war in Gaza, 129 hostages abducted that day to save, a northern border zone that's unlivable, and escalating tension in the West Bank, it seems beyond premature to believe that this unprecedented Iran-Israel open conflict is anything like over. All right, so pretty depressing. And uh, to know that uh, this uh, one-time short-lived victory Saturday night is really just um, uh, reflects so many other deeply held and nuanced ideas about what what the future holds so wanted to share all that any any thoughts or comments before we conclude well uh, I, I, think I, I think i've said this before is that uh, europe can't defend itself without the united states asia can't defend itself without the united states and israel can't defend itself without the united states that's right that's right so I'm just hoping that the intelligence of the United States is working in close coordination with the intelligence of Israel. I think they are. I think Burns has been over there. It seems it seems to be. That's what Tom Thomas Friedman um, seems to be up on all of that, and it, it seem he seemed to imply that uh, U.S. intelligence is closely coordinating with Israel. So yeah. I mean, so, and that's what the United States has to do, has to be the, the, the representative of protecting democracy and freedom around the world. Um, and it's, you know, that, that reflects also, you know, the, the upcoming election. Does the, the opposing candidate to Biden agree with that 
idea that United States needs to be active around the world to protect uh, countries around the world. So, you know, so, yeah, go ahead. So whatever you think about Netanyahu, you know, politically, uh, he seems to be, he has to listen to Biden. Uh, you would think so. You, you would know. think so. That if he doesn't, he'd, he'd be risking a lot more uh, than if he listened, than, than the political risks of listening to him. Right. In yeah. other words, he has the, the risk of losing his right wing parties if he doesn't retaliate. But he, he loses a lot more if he doesn't listen to Biden. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, what, whatever we think about Netanyahu, we're stuck with him for now. Um, but most everyone in Israel agrees that Netanyahu is now the worst prime minister in the history of Israel because he put Israel at the brink of extinction on October 7th. Mm -hmm. so, so he's trying to figure out some kind of face saving. Perhaps, maneuver. perhaps as some way out. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Right. Bob, I, what are you doing? I, first off, um, the Iranians are not stupid. I think they did the smart thing by telegraphing this stuff. There, there are weapon systems that are not easily to pick up. They didn't use it. I don't know if they have it, but they didn't use anything. Right. That's, the fact that they picked up so many and they telegraphed it, I think it was more for the Iranian people. Look what we're doing. So they calmed them down. And if Israel says, we may not come after you now, but one day we will, that should be sufficient. And, and one day they'll get them. May not be today. May not. They'll get him eventually. But if he does anything now, he is really, really stupid. And right wing nuts like Bolton that said, "Oh, go in there and destroy everything." He's insane. So, without making value judgments like that, I would say I, that sorry. it's I think, okay. I can do that. I'm not a rabbi. I, I it's don't okay. Have a it's okay. I'm just pointing out that yes, it's it's difficult making these making these assessments are, are very difficult. Um, and you couldn't pay me, uh, uh, you couldn't pay me enough to, uh, to, to be a political leader uh, like, uh, like these people are. So much to have to weigh uh, and uh, against each other, different factors like that. So um, yeah, the, the problem is that it's, it's a natural human feeling to want to take revenge, right? So it, it's, it's, it's quite something that the Christian Bible teaches, right? Turn the other cheek. That is an unnatural human response to someone slapping you in the face. So uh, to uh, the religion tries to teach us to at times to go against human nature, right? And there's, there's limits to how much against human nature we can go. In other words, even God learned the lesson that people can't be vegetarian, right? People were vegetarian in the Garden of Eden. It led to, it, by, by Noah's generation, people had been corrupted on earth. And so after, after the flood, God makes a covenant with Noah and provides a provision on how to kill animals for food. So even God recognizes there's a limit to human nature and how much we can expect people or ask people to change or to do things that are unnatural. So to, to, uh, to um, hold back on revenge is very, very hard. And um, so, yes, you can, you, and you have to be um, uh, yeah, rational at the time that you're deciding whether to enact revenge or not. So, right, in the heat of the moment, it's kind of hard to listen to rational, objective arguments. So that's what a political leader has to do. And so we're hoping Yes, that Israel not respond, uh, that Israel should respond, it has the right to respond, 
but it should hold off on doing anything that could prompt Iran to escalate this to the point where the United States will say, sorry, not helping you. So lots of things at stake here. So um, with that, we'll, we'll end for today. Um, next, the next two Mondays, uh, we will not have Jews in the news. Next Monday is the day of the Seder. So Monday morning, the service and the, the study session and burning the chametz, it's gonna take a little bit longer and then uh, getting ready for Passover. And then the following Monday is the seventh day of Passover. So it's Yuntiv. so uh, no class then either. So we'll meet again um, th uh, three weeks from today. Okay. Have a good yeah, rest of the day, everybody. Yeah, Yashikoa, Jonah. Have a good day, everybody.